Can you all hear me? Yes. Thank you. I am happy to meet you here, friends. Welcome to this monthly meeting. We have these monthly meetings so that uh, we remain on track, our minds being what they are. If we don't meet regularly, which we call satsangs, which means company of the truth, we share things which we think are true, and therefore this meeting is called a satsang. Sat means truth, sang means company. So it's useful to meet because then we can bring the mind back on track. And if we have been slow in meditation, restart it. If we have not been following certain good rules which we had promised to ourselves, we can restart them. If we have made some New Year's vows on 1st of January and have forgotten about them, we can restart those. So these are good opportunities. And uh, great master, this picture you see behind me, used to say, this is like a fence against negativity. That meeting regularly, sharing these views about truth, is like a fence we built so that negativity cannot enter, which really means the mind leading us astray is checked by these kinds of meetings. So I'm very happy that you are here for this monthly meeting. There are several questions that people ask me during their emails with me. I get lots of emails. Since I had my breakfast and till I got here, I was looking up 175 new messages. So you can imagine how many messages I get. Uh, many of them are just uh, messages of expressing their thanks or good feelings for what, they have, what is happening. And they don't need a reply, but some of them need a reply. So I stack them up and I try to answer. If it is very urgent, immediately. If it is not, in the order in which it is received. So some people send me several messages. I sent you a message last week. Why haven't I got an answer? I am only available till 3 p.m. today. Please reply. <laughs> <coughs> I get all kinds of messages. So I am just mentioning this to you, that please have some patience. Some of the questions you ask are not that urgent, and even if a reply comes 30, 40 days later, it is still an appropriate reply, and it is still in time, because those questions relate to our whole life. And life is not a few days. So that is why uh, have some patience in expecting replies uh, from the email you send me. But don't hesitate to send me emails. Somebody wrote to me, I have lots of questions, but I don't write to you because I know you are busy. Well, I am busy in answering such questions, so don't hesitate to write to me if you need to. Having said all this, I would like to say that the message which we are sharing is a very simple one. The message is, can we find out who we really are? Is this body our own self? Have we been born in a physical body and will die? Is that all our existence or there is more than that? If it is more than that, who are we before we were in the body and after we die? We, it is some simple question and so many of us have that question. Can we find out when we do find out, all of us, when we die? Naturally. If we die and we find out we are still there, that means we got an answer that the body was not ourself, that we still survive. If you go to uh, some people who believe in past life regressions, they say we were able to hear such good information about our past lives. They explain our current life. Then those people get convinced there was a past life also. And that means it was not this body but we were in a separate body. It's a very fundamental question to find out who are we. But we can find that before dying also by a process called dying while living. You might have heard of that process called dying while living. Dying while living simply means that you are able to reach a state of this body which is like that. And therefore you are not aware of it as you would be when you actually physically die. And if you can have that experience while you are living, then you can find out who you are after you will be dead. 
And this can be found out even right now while we are living in our bodies. And this dying while living is a great process. It helps us to understand we are not the body, we are more than that. How do we die while living? Simply by withdrawing our attention from this body. It's a very great gift given to us by the Creator that we can withdraw our attention. Attention is what connects us with this world. If you don't pay any attention to anything, it doesn't exist. It's only your conscious attention that you give to things that make them real for you. We talk to people by giving attention. We look at things around us with our attention. If there is no attention, there is nothing existing. Attention is very important. People talk of higher awareness. Awareness is not in your control. Now we are sitting here, we are aware, we are sitting in a hall. And the awareness is the same for everybody. We can't change it. But you can decide to put your attention on something within this awareness, such as I can put my attention on these beautiful flowers. And I can say, now I am enjoying my flowers. I wasn't paying attention to it when I was talking earlier. So I moved my attention to something, which means we have a power to direct our attention wherever we like. We can't change awareness, but within awareness, we can direct our attention wherever we like. Now that's beautiful, because that way we can even put our attention on who we are in this physical body. By simply contemplating, who is it that speaks? Who is it that thinks? Where do we think? Where do we ask these questions? And if you look at your physical body and you say, where am I asking this question? Your hands are so far away from where you are asking the question. Your feet are even further away. Your legs are away. Even your whole torus is away. You are not asking from any of these parts of your body. The question and thought that is coming is coming only in your head. It doesn't take long to know that, that everything is happening because of your head, your conscious awareness from where you put attention on something is in your head. Can we then put our attention on where we are thinking inside the head? That's the secret. It's a little difficult to do it because in our use of attention, we have been practicing putting attention on things outside of our body all the time. We have trained our attention to focus on things. Now, focusing attention always takes you outside from your head because you have to focus on something outside. That is why we have trained our attention to be always moving outside. Now is a new challenge. How to put the attention back inwards? And where do we want to put the attention inside? From where it's coming out. We want to take our attention to its origin from where it comes out. If you are thinking of something, where are we thinking from? We go back to that. This process is not focusing attention at all. This process is called withdrawal of attention. You withdraw your attention to where you are and not focus. We have got so used to focusing attention on this that even when people are told about meditation and told meditate upon your own self, they have to close their eyes and make a picture of themselves in front of them and focus on that. Just because we are used to it. That is not withdrawal of attention at all. And people are doing it for years. They come to me and tell me, we have been meditating on the self. I said, where is the self? When we close our eyes, we see ourselves in front of us. That's not you. The one looking at that image in you is you. But we don't withdraw attention to that. Because practice of withdrawal of attention is different. Not that it is very difficult, but we don't understand how withdrawal of attention is different from focusing attention. Focusing attention requires that you be ready to look at something in front of you, even inside or outside. That is focusing your attention. And that's what we start doing because of our natural habit of doing that. Withdrawal of attention means going back to where you are focusing from. There is no focusing involved at all. To withdraw back, we have another gift given to us by your Creator. And that gift is called imagination. 
Now we sometimes just dismiss imagination. It's only imaginary, it's not real. It doesn't matter real or unreal. Imagination can be used to withdraw your attention to yourself by imagining you are not sitting in this body but sitting behind the eyes. When you imagine you are sitting there, you are not focusing anywhere. You are just imagining you are there. And if you are there, you are in the right place. Now, do you have to find a place where you are sitting inside? Not at all. People write to me emails. We are still searching for the third eye center. I said, you are at the third eye center. You cannot be anywhere else. Why are you trying to search for something where you are? If I'm sitting here, I'm finding out where I am here. I'm here. That's why we are already there from where we are putting attention out. And that is why it's not necessary to search for third eye center. You know that you are there if you are awake. If you are not awake, then you have to find. If you are sleeping, your attention and yourself, the focus from where you think is different. It's not there at all. This body is constructed in such a strange way that only in our wakeful state, like we are here now, only in the wakeful state, when we look at things outside, when we talk to people, we are automatically at the third eye center and using our attention to scatter ourselves outside. Attention is scattered at this time. It is scattered in two ways. One, we have so many things around us. We try to grasp all, all of them with our attention and therefore we are scattered. And secondly, we scatter by thoughts. We think of other things that are outside and their part of the attention goes there. So we are scattering our attention both with our eyes physically and with sound that we hear and also the thoughts that we have. We have to just stop scattering attention and we'll be at third eye center. How do we stop it? So far as the vision in front are concerned, close your eyes. Not good enough? Cover them more. If that's not good enough, go into a dark room so that you are not distracted by attention going into physical phenomena outside you. Sounds, plug your ears. No sound should bother you. Thoughts, replace thoughts with something artificial, like a mantra, like words that you don't understand and repeat them continuously. Repeat them to such an extent you don't give any time for the mind to think of other things. Think only of the words you are repeating. And if you find that you repeat the words and there is another voice inside still commenting upon them, the mind can think in more than one channel. Then make the second line also repeat the words. If you find ten lines, all ten should repeat the words. Like a chorus going on in your head. Supposing you see an image of some person you like come in to distract you, add that person to the repetition so that nothing else is there except the repetition of that mantra given to us or the simran given to us and that blocks the thought. You are able to be a third eye center. Very useful, simple methods by gifts given to us by the creator. The gift given to us of having a physical body with this arrangement existing in sight where we can have an experience of a wakeful state at a third eye center from where then, if we can achieve that state, we can enter into another state of awareness. First step is simple, that we can block the scattering of attention. By these means, if you can block the attention from flowing out and you really concentrate there, what will happen? You are still there. You know you are the one who will draw your attention. You know you are the one who has been able to withdraw attention and you are now sitting inside somewhere. You don't know where you are sitting. When you started, you know you were sitting in the body. But when you are withdrawing attention there, what will be happening to the body? If you are putting all the attention there by repetition of words, what will happen is you are not putting enough attention to the body. What happens actually is when you do that, after a while you say, we don't know where your hands are. You don't know where your feet are. And as you continue to be there, you don't know where your legs and arms are born. Eventually you feel you are flying in the sky somewhere because you lose even a sensation of your own bottom. 
eventually you don't know where your body is. When you don't even know where your body is, how do you know where you are? What, what should you do then? Then say, but I am still looking at something. What are we looking at? If we are not even aware of our eyes, not aware of our ears, not aware of our whole body, what are we looking at? And we find we are still looking at things. And we are still hearing sounds and noises. We are still functioning like we are a human being. How can we still keep on functioning like a human being with all our sense perceptions intact when we are completely unaware of our body? Then we can look at our hands. Not these hands. The hands that appear when we are there. We can look at our body. We can look at our feet and look at sky. Look everywhere around what is there. That is the first time you discover that you have an inner self, an inner body, almost like this body. That functions with sense perceptions and it has the capacity to see, hear, touch, taste, smell exactly like we do this. this. In fact, a sharper sense perception. Then you can do what you like. You can fly in the sky. You can explore the galaxies. You can do what you like. You will find that body has no weight at all. That body is not made like this. It's light. And as you stay in that body, you get many new experiences. But the biggest experience is that you know you are never this physical body. That you have something sitting inside. If you do this practice for a while, you will find that it is that inner body with the sense perceptions that is making this body see, touch, taste and smell. If that were not there, you would not be able to have any sense perceptions on this body. That is the purpose of meditation. To go within. To find out this is not the body. Then, can we still have a mind to think? Of course. We are thinking all the time. We have reached a point where the mind is now free. We are unconscious of this body. But the mind is still thinking. Can we remember things? Like we now can remember some things. I can remember that I looked up at my iPhone when I was driving here to see how many messages have come. I remember where I was yesterday in a meeting. I remember those things. These memories are coming where I'm in a physical body. Do we have memories there also? Then you can start remembering. And that will be a very surprising experience for you. Because you will remember what you did 100 years ago or 200 years ago. You remember what happened way before this body was born. And they are not somebody else's memories. They are yours. And then you realize that you had an experience in that body which, which was way beyond earlier and later than this body. Time will have a different feeling at that time. There are so many changes that take place. Many advanced mystics have been able to achieve that and taught other people to achieve that. Great Master taught that as, as lesson number one because he said there are many more lessons. Many mystics have just said this is it. Because if you are in that state, you can visit so many places and see. You can also see there are heavens and hells in that area, which we read about, but we never seen. But we can see them. This body, we sometimes call the inner body, we call the suksham sharir or the astral body or the sensory body. It has all the sense perceptions, but there's no matter in it. There are no atoms or molecules in it, but sense perceptions are intact. In fact, the sense perception itself is the astral body. And that's how they fit into this body and we have our sense perceptions here. It's a very interesting experience to find this out. It's great to know that because it helps us a lot. Then once we are back in this body and we are aware, this is temporary stuff. The other one, I can remember I was there much earlier. I'll be there much longer. It's only temporary that I'm here. If we really know this is temporary stuff, our attitude in the world changes. Because then we say this is a temporary show we are in. And also we can do another thing. With practice, we can continue to stay there in that inner form that we discovered and still let the body operate. So we become a witness of the show of life. That life is like a show, like a drama going on, and we are watching it, not acting in it.
that the, our body is acting and we are watching. If all the people are characters in the show. This world has been constructed like a drama on a stage. The stage is called time space. And on the stage, all these characters have been brought up. We are also a character as a body. When we go to see a movie, we sit in the hall and we watch the movie very attentively. When we are watching the movie on the screen, we forget it is only a blank white sheet with some shadows being dropped on it from a projector behind us. We forget it because we want to enjoy the movie. We try to make it real. We try to say what will happen next. We sit at Tenterhu and some sad things happen, we cry. Comedy, com comedic actions take place, we laugh. We are taking it as real. Actually, it is not real at all. But we make it look real, deliberately, in order to enjoy it. Now, we are sitting in the audience, movie is taking place on a screen. Nobody is trying to find out where these pictures are coming from. If they were to find out, they will say, there is nothing on the screen at all. Pictures are coming from behind. Behind us, projectors always behind us. And we go there and we turn around and say, how does this happen? We look at the projector, there is a film loaded in it. And the complete film is there. Not part of it. Whatever is going to happen on the movie will happen, no matter what. It cannot be changed unless we change the film. It cannot be changed at all. And there is light behind the film going through the projector. If there is no light, everything stops. Light, film, screen are necessary to have a movie. The same thing is true here. In this play which is going on, there is the light of our own soul, consciousness. If we are not conscious, there is no play. Consciousness is the light. The mind that holds the film, pre-recorded destinies, the light flows through that. And this outside time space is the screen on which it falls. It is the same thing, exactly. One difference is there. In the movie, you are sitting away from the screen. In this show, to make it even more realistic, you sit in one of the characters of the show. And that you call yourself. It's just a character. That you begin to sit inside the character so you can be ab absolutely close to the screen of time space right here. And that is how we are supposed to be enjoying this movie temporarily. We go home. We have been caught up so much in this movie, we even forgotten our home. We don't want to go back home. Once uh, there was a Swami, he came to a little hut in Manali in India. I was camping there for something when I was working in that area. And he used to sometime walk with me in the morning and tell me stories. He told me two beautiful stories. I'll, t I'll recite them as best as I can. The one story was that there was a king most Indian stories start like that. Once upon a time, there was a king. And he had a very big kingdom. He was a very nice king. He took care of everybody. And he was so peaceful, so kind. There were no wars in his country. He said to himself, if there is no war, and we keep our army just like that, if there is war, they'll be untrained. So they should get training. So he divided his army into two blocks, red block and blue block, and said, or... I'm not talking of any reference to the political situation in this country, by the way. <laughs> he divided into red and blue armies and they had mock fighting. But since people would think the real battle has started, he covered that area where the mock battle was going on by wooden planks, like a wall of wooden planks. Unfortunately, in the wooden planks, there were little chinks left. When the war was taking place inside, nobody could see all the people began to search in the chinks and look, put their eyes there. And they began to see the war through those chinks. And it was so engrossing, red army winning, blue army winning, that when those people were with their eyes glued to that, their friends, their family members would call them, come on time for dinner. Wait, there's a battle going on here. They would not leave the chinks. That Swami told me, we are like that. We are looking through these chinks on something that is not real. It is just set up. 
and we take it as so real, we can't get out of it. We don't want to go back home at all. This is a nice story he told. The second story he told me was about practice. I've, I've narrated that story earlier. I can tell you again that once upon a time, there was a king. And he was a very sharp shooter with his arrow, bow and arrows. And he went out into the forest. He was so good in his bow and arrow, he could not only shoot at a target with his arrow, if the target was on the flat surface of the, of the plain earth, he could shoot the arrow up. It would come down right on the target. Great expert. After he was returning, he saw his wife, his queen, standing on the balcony of the palace. Up there. He said, I am going to give her a surprise. For the queen was wearing a, a big ornament, a, a big diamond or something, on her head. And it was on the forehead of the queen. Shining in the sky, in the sun, so he took aim, and the arrow went up and came down, took the ornament down. The queen didn't even know. So clever. When he came up, he said, "My dear queen, where is your ornament you always wore here?" She says, "Oh, I might have dropped somewhere." He said, "No, look, it's in my arrow here." <laughs> and she looked at the arrow. Yeah, he said, "Don't you see what I achieved?" Yeah, by practice one can do anything. She, he was so mad and he had accomplished such a big thing. That's all the comments this woman can give me. He said, you are no longer my queen. He asked the guards, go and drop her in the forest. Let the wild animals eat her up. So she was taken away to the forest. And there, all the animals got around. The new, new creature has come in. They didn't know who it was. A female elephant was giving birth to a baby elephant. And she saw the baby elephant being born. And she took the baby elephant. And there was a little stream, gave a little bath in the, to the baby elephant and played with it a little bit in her, arm, in her hands. And then put it on the feet of the mother elephant. Mother elephant was very pleased. This woman did this every day. The baby elephant becoming bigger and bigger. But as she was doing it every day, her strength in the arms grew accordingly. And even when the baby elephant like a bigger elephant, she was still playing with it. Once a troop of entertainers came to the forest and they saw a woman carrying an elephant. <clears throat> they were surprised. How can a woman carry an elephant? They came to her, said, we'll hire you for a very nice fee. We'll give you nice clothes, nice salary. You come and entertain people. So she joined them and began to entertain people. They went to the same city where the king lived. And the king heard there's a woman who can lift an elephant. He organized a show in his own palace. Lawns, he invited everybody come and see a woman can lift an elephant. And the woman came and lifted an elephant. And the king took out some jewels and some money and said, I must give it to this woman. He came and said, you have done such a remarkable thing to lift an elephant in your hands. I give you all this as a reward. She says, no, by practice one can do anything. He said, this must be my queen. And he took her back into the palace. The story is just to emphasize, with practice you can do anything. And what I was talking earlier about meditation, practice is the secret. Practice is the secret not possible if you do it once in a while. If the woman had tried to do it once in a while, she would never have been able to pick the elephant. To the daily practice. If we want to make use of meditation, please see that it is a daily practice and you will succeed. If you say on weekends I am free, then I will meditate. That's not called daily practice. Many of us fail in that. That we are busy with things which are part of the show. We are busy giving more importance to what is temporary than what is permanent. And that is why it's like a waste of time. To just keep on thinking, this is very important for me. We have wrong priorities. If you really want to take advantage of the spiritual path, which will lead you to discovery of yourself, make it a regular practice every day, every morning, every night. I can tell you from experience, these two times you deserve, no matter what, if you are tired, if you are very busy, Give a shorter time. If you are not so busy, give longer time to meditation. If you can't find two and a half hours 
recommended time. Why is two and a half hours recommended? Do you know that? From the tithes. They used to say, the charity you should give, the tithe you should give, the donation should be one tenth of your income. Meditation is like a charity given to yourself. At least one tenth of the time available. In every 24 hours, one tenth is two and a half hours. That's how it was suggested. It's just one tenth of your time. But if you cannot find the time because of the priorities you already laid down in your life, you can give less, half an hour, 15 minutes, 5 minutes. How about 5 minutes? 5 minutes in the morning, 5 minutes at night is a good start. But 0 minutes is not a good start. <laughs> so 5 minutes at least. So make it regular, make it every day and you will find the results. If you start thinking, oh, it's some part-time thing, it won't work. Firstly, withdraw attention to yourself at third eye center. Do not try to focus on anything. Focusing will not take you within yourself. It will take you outside, no matter whether your eyes are closed or open. I even have demonstrated to people, when they close their eyes and make an image, little image of themselves sitting there, thinking that's us. I have told them, okay, if you have your hands to touch your eyes, can you touch them? Yes. Can you touch them with the eyes closed? Yes. We know where the eyes are. We don't have to open the eyes to see where the, where the eyes are. And we can know we have touched the eyes. And okay, now the experiment comes. You close your eyes and make that image in sight. And then bring your hands up like this slowly. You'll be surprised you just cross that image before you touch your eyes. Where was the image? Outside. Even physically outside. You thought it was inside because your eyes were closed. It doesn't make things inside. Who was inside? The one looking at that image. And that's yourself, not the image. So do not be confused by trying to make an image and say that's me inside. That's still outside. So who is inside? The one who looked at it. Who is looking at it? Yourself. So when you are imagining you are here, it's only to withdraw your attention over there. It's not that this attention will put you there. You're already there. You're just putting your attention where you are in the wakeful state. Now, this is a great thing if you can achieve it. And it's a very big thing. And our people have achieved it. Many have achieved it. With some effort, struggle, you can achieve it. But this is not the end of our journey. It's just discovering another body. It's not self-realization. It's nowhere close to God realization or realization of the creator who it is. It is still self-realization, partly. Because we are still discovering another body of ours. Who is in that body? Not this one. Can we then repeat the same thing with the inner body? Of course. But you have to first stabilize the experience of the inner body by regular practice. When it becomes natural for you, that even when these eyes open and working in this world, you're conscious that it's actually that one working inside. Then you start the internal meditation in the internal body, not with this body. And people fail here. They think to go beyond that body also, we sit in this body and do meditation. This cannot take you further than what I've described. And that's the end. This next meditation must be with the inner body which is not as easy as doing with this body because we are not used to it. If you are used to it, if you are for a few months, for a few years, you are used to knowing that body, it becomes easy. Otherwise, it's difficult to sit there knowing you are there. You can do many activities with that body like flying, like standing up, like running in different fields that you create imaginatively. You can have a lot of experience of your inner self, sensory self, but once you are sure you can always have that, then you can start the meditation within that body. When you will withdraw attention to the third eye center inside that body, you'll find it's the same third eye center. You have never had second third eye center. It's the same third eye center. And that was operating through the inner body and the outer body. And you're still back there. And other body opens up. Sense perceptions are lost. Just like this awareness of the body is lost, the whole sense that you can see, touch, taste, smell is gone. Then what is left? Thoughts are left. 
you are still thinking. You can think anything you like. And you find how thoughts are so powerful that those thoughts created events in your life, in the outer lives. That body is called the Karan Sharir or the causal body. Why is it called causal body? Because all experiences that we are having here are created from there. And what is essentially that causal body? It's our mind. The thinking mind is the causal body. Just like sense perceptions are indeed the astral body. And matter creating this body is the physical body. It's very clear. If you enter the causal body, it's a huge space. You discover space and time in a very different way. The vastness cannot be expressed here. The time is under your control. Time is not something that is flowing. Time is on which you are flowing. You are actually flowing on that time even now, but you don't know it. There you find you uh, come to know you flow on time and create events. Not that time is moving through you. Time is all steady, static, all the time, even now. We move by attention on that time, creating events of this life. There you can discover and see time, static, and move on it either direction, backwards or forwards. You can see all past events placed on time, all future events. You can also see, if you advance further, exploring that area, you can also see how your destinies were made, how you picked up your destiny. From there, all destinies are made there. Everything that you have experienced here is sitting there. There is nothing beyond. You will also discover that your mind which thinks is only a single universal mind in which you are participating and it looks like your individual mind. These are very big discoveries. So many Mahatmas, Yogis, mystics came and thought that is it. But everything is created from there. They said, that's our true God, true Bhagwan, true everything, true creating, creative power. They claimed that there is nothing beyond that because everything that they ever experienced came from there. And most people end their journey there, thinking we have reached our salvation, we have discovered ourselves. Our self was that great thinking machine created everything. Nobody wants to question what is making the thinking machine work? Is Thinking the same thing as awareness? Or can we be aware without thinking? Are we concentrating ourselves only on thought and not discovering what is beyond thought? And that is when seekers who want to seek beyond find a way out. How do they find a way out? There is no way you can do anything. Because even effort stops there. All effort is made by the mind, by thinking. And you can't even make an effort anymore. What can take you beyond that? The answer is very simple. Seeking to go beyond that will make it happen. This is also happening because of seeking. You are sitting here because you are seekers. You are seeking something. Whatever you seek, you get that. If you want to seek more than that and say, I want to find out the ultimate that can make a mind work, then what will happen? Since you can do nothing, Nobody can ever do anything. And I've seen nobody has ever done anything, ever, to go beyond. The only other way is that some power that is beyond the mind, beyond that state, pulls you. Now, this is the big secret of the true spiritual path. The secret is to be pulled there. It should not be your mind thinking, mind to be pulled. Because you can't go beyond that. It should be your consciousness, your soul, your inner self which makes the mind work, which makes this body work, which makes the senses work. That self of yours has to be pulled. We call it the soul. We distinguish the soul from the mind. Soul is consciousness. Mind is a thinking machine in time and space. Mind cannot function outside of time and space. It creates it and functions in it. But the soul is outside of it. Soul empowers it. It gives the power. Soul is consciousness that makes it alive. All life comes from soul, not from mind. So to be pulled by, by the soul, it must be a power that is beyond the mind. And must be a power that is visible to us 
so we can know their power is there depending on where we are supposing we are at the state in the causal plane it must appear to us in the causal plane if we are at the astral plane it must appear to us in the astral plane if we are sitting here in the physical plane it must appear to us here now how in what form can it appear here something that is beyond the mind a human being like ourselves who by some means which are the same means i am going to explain has been able to go above the mind and while he is human here he is conscious of the state above the mind not that he can be one day conscious or was one day conscious but is conscious of the state above the mind while he is here with us and talking to us if such a person exists and he his awareness is beyond the mind while he is sitting here and talking to us he is not talking from any of the three divisions of created universes of the mind or the astral self or the physical self he is pulling us from above what is that which can pull a soul what kind of rope is there that we can tie up on a soul and pull it that rope is called love love is the secret that is why such people who come and i call them perfect living masters and they have been called perfect living masters they they are called that pural satguru they have been called murshid e kamal they have been called by these names that they are perfect what is how is they are perfect they are like us they are human being like us with all the imperfections that human beings have they also have why do we call them perfect their perfection comes from beyond the mind which is perfect within the mind everything is imperfect because their awareness is beyond the mind therefore we call them perfect why do we call them perfect living masters because they are living in the same form as we are if they living in other form the only communication is with our mind if they are living in physical form where we are physical we can interact and our mind may say is something else they can correct us right here so that is why these are perfect living masters they are unique people very rare they appear where seekers are seeking more than the mind can offer and how do they work what is how do they what is their method of working they become friends they become our friends and we like them for some reason which we can't always explain then they seem to pull us from some kind of a love we get more attached to them mind says don't believe but you say let's go and see them mind says you get nothing say, let's go at least see there is something that happens to us what is actually happening is nothing more than the soul pulling the soul the mind and the body are not involved and this is their method their method is to pull us with their love because love comes from beyond the mind love intuition sudden knowledge knowing everything suddenly without thinking comes from beyond the mind and they operate from there but to be friends it is easy if they are friends it is easy to be in love also with them so that is why they become friends so that we can respond to the love more quickly and better that's why they become friends now in order to be friends they have to be like us if they are not like us we can't be friends we can admire them we can adore them we can worship them but you can't be friends that is why they live a completely ordinary life like us sometimes more ordinary than us why more ordinary because in their work of taking those souls that are seeking beyond the mind into their true home such hunt true home to take them to their true home they have to be friends with them at different stations of life some people are poor and they are poor with them some they are rich they are rich with them some are very simple plain simple people talking simple language they talk simple language with them other people are very intellectually sharp they talk sharp language with them they adjust their relationship in that friendship according to the seeker and therefore because they have such capacity to be versatile 
in meeting the seekers at their own level and become friends. Therefore, sometimes we say they are more ordinary than ordinary. They act sometimes more ordinary than ordinary. They don't do any public miracles to show who they are. Who they are to whom? It's a created universe. It's not our place. It's not our home. They are talking of their true home. They are not going to perform anything in, over here. And they have the power of love to pull, it, pull the person, pull the soul back to its true home. So they don't come for showing anything here. And it won't work if they show it. And I give an example that supposing a master appears here while I'm talking to you. If he appears from the door and starts flying up here, I'll stop talking naturally. I look at him, who's the guy? You will all look up and we'll be surprised. And we'll wonder, is there a rope attached or is there a string? How is he doing it? First, we will try to rationalize it by the known accepted methods of the working of this universe. No. If we see there's no rope and it's still flying, then what will happen? Some of us might faint even to see that. Some of us will be surprised. Big guy, real, real master. Somebody really with power. And we, some may worship him. Nobody will be his friend. Nobody will ever think of friendship with that. If he happens to fall down while performing the trick, so many of us will run to him and pick him up. And then he can be a friend. Can you imagine how ordinary one has to be to have true friendship? And they are true friends because they can be at our level. And that is why these perfect living masters come in a way and live a life that is so ordinary so that they can be friends with the seekers who are ordinary. And their work is not to teach them anything. They have come to take the seeker back to the true home. Once they find out, this seeker is waiting for several lifetimes to go back to true home and is now ready to go back home. They will make sure that seeker is taken back home no matter what. The seeker says, what should I do? Now, what should they say? The correct answer would be nothing. Do nothing, I'll take you home. Does the seeker believe? No, if I do nothing, I'll get nothing. I have been taught you can get nothing from nothing. You have to work for anything you want to get. All my life I have been taught that. All my 1000 previous lives I have been taught that. You have to work to get something. All right, work, do meditation. Do meditation, follow these rules. These rules are introduced for what? For our minds, not for the soul. They are not taking the mind, they are taking the soul. But they go to the level of making you meditate and you meditate hard. Say, I see some flashes of light. I have now gone somewhere. I have been able to withdraw my self -ex. Very good, very good. Keep doing. <laughs> Why? Now you are willing to go further. At some point, one says, I can't go any further. I tried very hard for years and I'm stuck. Oh, you are stuck? Don't worry. We'll find another way for it. Okay, do more seva then. Okay, do something else. What happens? What is happening during this period? Our love and devotion is growing. And that is the secret. And that's what they're doing. They are performing a jugglery of some sort of making our mind go into a state where it gives up at a certain point. I know I can't do anything on my own. That's what everybody at a certain point says. I have done, I find out it's not. It's grace of the Master, grace of the Lord that will do it. And they want you to come to that point. No matter how long it takes. They are not dealing with a soul that has just come and gone. They're dealing with the soul trapped in this experience of being born again and again in several lifetimes, not only of human beings, of several life forms. And only one time has come after millions of years. When the time is right and you say, I'm tired of it, I don't want to be here anymore, I want to go back home. The only requirement for going back to your true home to such Khand is to be a seeker of such kind, true home and not of anything else. If you seek other things, you will get those. 
But if you seek to go beyond all this, then such a rare person who are very rare in this world. Why rare? Because seekers are very rare of that kind. When such seeker says what, such a person will appear in your life no matter what. Circumstances will be so created. Coincidences will happen in such a way that such a human being, we call a perfect living master, will appear in your life. It's amazing how those coincidences work and how these perfect living masters become available. It's a big universe. It's a big universe. On this planet, 7 billion people are living on it. So there are seekers all over the globe. Some are seeking halfway, some are seeking a little more. So those seekers who are seeking different levels of experiences, some want to go to heaven. And many religions have made heaven a good destination. And therefore people say, want to go to heaven. They meet masters who take them to heaven, to the astral plane. Several masters have come, taken them to heaven. That's what they wanted. That's what they're seeking. The seekers who have experienced these things and want to go beyond are very rare. And those rare seekers who want to go beyond are the ones that they call marked souls. And the marked souls are marked for the master of that time, of that area, that region, where he can, in the circumstances of this physical world, appear there. And that is why there can be more than one master appearing in different parts of the globe. And there can be very few masters if the seekers are very few. Masters at that level appear for seekers. They don't appear just to spread a message. They have no message to spread. After the masters die, we create the messages from the masters and set up religions. Religion is an aftershoot of a perfect masters coming and giving us a method to go within. We forget about within and we make outside temples, churches, mosques. We build them outside and think that's the place uh, which is called house of God. The founder didn't say that build a building outside and worship inside that. They said this body of yours is the real living temple living God. This is the temple in which you should go. But we, after their departure, make everything external, rituals, different kind of rituals, separate each other from one another. I know, a, I went to one of these Mormon churches in Hawaii and they said, give your address, we'll send you books. I happened to give my address. Two young men came with the books to my house and they would not leave me. <laughs> I found that they were really very serious. I, okay, I'll take I, one of the books, the Bible, new Bible. So I saw the new Bible and opened the page. It says, we are introducing in this Bible from the 14 other Bibles. I was surprised the 14 Bibles? I thought they, they should call the word of God. I didn't know he spoke 14 times differently. Then I began to say, let me go to church and check up. I went to a church. They said, this is not our Bible. There's somebody else go there. I said, who are you? Oh, we are a Baptist. Who are you? I'm a Methodist. Who are you? We Lutheran. We are Catholic. No, no, we are British Catholic, not Roman Catholic. I said, what is this? Are you following different teachers, a separate Jesus Christ or the same? Same Jesus Christ. Is he the same God? Same God, same Savior, same Jesus Christ and so many churches and one will not go to the other church. I said, well, I had some Muslim friends of mine and I said, they praise Allah, Allah Akbar. I said, very good, Bismillah, Inshallah, milenge. all those talk came up and he said, don't go to that fellow. Said, Why? You know, he is not real, he is a Shia. Oh, who are you? I am a Sunni. Does he have a separate Allah or the same Allah? Same Allah. What about the Quran? Is he different Quran or your same book? Same Quran, same teaching. But we are very different. What has happened? Who did this? Who did the division? 
minds in the division, not the founders of the religions. And we can find this in every religion that how we have devolved into something external from something that said was eternal. And this happened everywhere. So one surprise, surprised at how religions are created and are designed to keep us tied up here. I said, at least they must be teaching you how to do meditation. No, not much. Listen to other people. I said to one friend of mine, that do you pray? He says, no. Somebody else prays for me. I said, how can that be? He says, you can turn on a channel so and so on the radio. And that man says, send me $25. I pray for you. <laughs> we made such a big business out of it. That's, what, that's why it's so rare to find seekers who are all beyond that, who don't want to do this, want to find their true home, such hunt. They want to go to their true home. And it is for those seekers that his perfect living masters come to. But even when we go to perfect living masters, I've sat with great master and sat with him, watching people come to him. And what do they ask him? Master, my son is not studying properly. Please make him pass his exams. My so and so is not feeling healthy. Please give him some grace so he can get health. I myself were broke and therefore please help me how to get out of the situation. My wife has run away. Please tell me how to get her back to my house. The other guy has captured my wife and gone away. How to punish him, please? <laughs> Kill him. Where is the talk of such kind? Where is the talk of true hope? Even those who have found a perfect living master are only asking for small things of this world. And some of them ask about meditation, and that also elementary questions. So uh, elementary questions which show all they want is something great experience inside. Because some religions and their good experiences, heaven is very good. And some people told me, you should become a Muslim. I said, why? In Bahisht, in heaven, you get whores, beautiful women. I said, there are a lot of beautiful women in this world also. If I am not attracted to these, why will we be attracted to the who's there? <laughs> things like that. We are even in meditation asking for limited things. So that is why it's only a seeker who seeks to go beyond this drama, who says, I have had enough of all of this, including the drama of the mind. I have had enough of it. And I want to go to my true home. Let the perfect living masters take them to their true home. That the readiness of a soul to go back to true home. How do they do it? These perfect living masters, they appear and there are many people around them. Naturally, because people begin to believe we are all having a little problem. It's a deep problem, very deep problem that most of us have. And that deep problem, sometimes we are able to realize it, sometimes we don't know what is hurting. And that's the problem of a feeling of inner loneliness. We feel lonely inside. Even when we have company, we still feel they don't understand me. People around me don't understand me. Sometimes a couple comes to me and says, we are soulmates, made for each other. And we understand each other fully. Then they get married. And they don't understand each other at all. What's happened? What happens now? Their real self comes out. There are so many discrepancies between their views. And on small little things, they start fighting. They can take it for granted. Marriage is there. What can we do? After a while, they find out there is a solution to that. Divorce. Same people have come to me several times. Please bless us. We are getting married. We are soulmates. Blessings. Blessing is easy. Okay, bless you. <laughs> so they are blessed. Three months later, we are in divorce court. But you were soulmates. What happened? We knew from day one we were not made for each other. That's what they say. That's not what you said on that day when you got the blessings. These are things that are happening with us all the time. And we are all somewhere inwardly feeling we are actually alone. There's nobody really with us. 
and that is the truth. We are alone. Nobody is really with us. These are temporary games, temporary people. Why do they come into our life? They come into our life because we have to learn something, give something, take something, which is called settling the law of karma. It's just previous relationships that create the relationships of this life and we go through them. And that is why this is a temporary game of give and take, settling accounts. And all these, there's nothing real about it. After that, some people who have meditated and have gone and had glimpses of the causal plane have been so surprised to see that the plane was from that mind they were making up the people who they were seeing. It was a big shock to them. We thought they were real. We were giving them uh, so much attention to these people. They were being made up in our own minds. They could see that from the causal plane. It's a big shock to see we wake up the whole thing. Somebody said to me a story, interesting story. It's called the egg. I don't know if any of you have seen it. The egg. There's a conversation, a man is conversing. Uh, he's taking part of the conversation or part of both of them. And during that story, the person says, you are the only one. There's only one. There's not more than one. If that means I am you, yes, we are only one. But it looks like we are two. That's why I'm conversa in conversation I'm making it two. But what about all the people I meet? In the story he says, they are all yourself that you saw in your past incarnations. They all reappear again. That every person we are seeing here was linked with us. Some of us might be our own self. Many of the people we see were our own self and have appeared now as characters in this play. So that is why it's just a play. It's a play in which the characters interchange all the time and we are able to pay off our old accounts. That is a very big arrangement to keep as many souls as possible over here in this drama. The soul's natural inclination is to end the drama and go back home. How can you keep it forever? You keep it forever by creating conditions in which you desire experiences that are outside of you and you get attached to those experiences. You want more of those experiences. Then you are tired. You want other similar experiences and it goes on and on. You are caught up in these attachments that you make through desire. It's a system set up to keep this show going on. The show will go on forever with a beautiful system set up to keep the souls here. That is why it's only some souls who after a lot of experience say we are tired, we are done with this show. And they are marked to go back home and they are taken. But many others are also able to beat that master. A perfect living master. When he walks about in this world, so many people see him. And naturally some effect is left on them also. So what happened, what is the effect? That those very people become marked souls later on for another master to take. So this game goes on. We come from a true home. Everything else was set up from there. It's just a created universe one after the other. And when we are done and we want to go back home, we say, okay, I'm ready. And the perfect living master automatically comes into our life. Says, you are ready. Let's go home. I say, but what about... My struggle, okay, struggle, I'll take you back. Thank you very much for joining me today. I'll come to you for a few minutes again later in the afternoon. You have a nice break for lunch or snack. Are there any snacks available? Snacks available. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you later.